Good afternoon, and welcome to FUQA's Distinguished Speaker Series. I am Rachelle Olden, one of your executive fellows and a second year MBA student. We are pleased to welcome today the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of DaVita Incorporated, Mr. Kent Theory. <laughs> Kent's visit is a special opportunity for many of us FUQA students, FUQA students because it was only a few months ago that a second year, second years, raise your hand. Yep. So it's only a few months ago that a second years, and just a few days ago that the first years, first years, raise your hand. Awesome. That the first years were reading and debating over the DeVita case in our core strategy course. Today, what we learned in the classroom will come alive to us today here in Janine. Working hand in hand together, Kent and 71,000 teammates went from building the greatest dialysis company the world has seen to building the greatest healthcare community the world has ever seen. DaVita is a parent company of DaVita Kidney Care and DaVita Medical Group, with 2,445 outpatient dialysis centers in the United States and 217 in 11 other countries serving approximately 195,000 patients, DaVita Kidney Care is leading the charge in delivering dialysis services to patients with chronic kidney failure and end-stage renal disease. Its sister company, DaVita Medical Group, operates medical groups and affiliated physician networks in seven states. Entrepreneurship, authenticity, and unremittingness are three words that just might do justice in summing up what Kent offered DeVita back in October 1999 when he became the company's chairman and CEO. When DeVita was facing tough financial times and in need of a leader who could think way out of the box, Kent and 100 teammates stepped up to drive a new vision for the company, creating the DeVita Village. Yes, I said village. DeVita is not only a Fortune 500 company based in Denver, Colorado, with approximately $14 billion in annual revenue, it's a real village, a community of people whose core values include team, one for all and all for one, and fun. That does sound a bit like Team Fuqua. And Kent, <laughs> and Kent is their mayor. Over six years, Kent engineered an impressive financial turnaround and successfully developed a strong community-like culture. His leadership philosophy is a subject of study and a discussion at business schools, including his alma mater, Harvard, we won't blame him, and, and major outre outlets, outlets such as the Wall Street Journal. Some, has gone, some have gone as far as calling the Vita culture unconventional and eccentric. Having experienced the, the, the DeVita way for myself in meeting Kent in April 2016 during a pre-MBA visit, I'd call the culture passionate. The villagers embody the Italian meeting of DeVita, giving life, dedicating their head, heart, and hands to pursue the mission, live the seven values, and build a healthy village. We are fortunate to have four of our very own second year Fuquins headed to DeVita next summer. They're over there. <laughs> Raise your hands. <laughs> awesome. Kent is known for, fo for following the mantra, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. We are especially excited to hear how much Kent cares about, the, about DeVita and the DeVita community. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Kent Theory, the Duke way. Thank you. Wow, after that introduction, I don't think there's anything left to talk about, is there? We're, but, we're uh, going downhill. Yeah, very nicely done. So, uh, Kent, we're so happy to have you with us here today. And um, I understand that, that one of your favorite business tips is to uh, begin with the end in mind. So given that, uh, when we all walk out of here at the end of this session, what do you hope we will have accomplished? Damn, these are tough questions already. <laughs> yeah. well, I, would, I would say what we believe at the village is that we're sort of sharing life's journey at the continuous process of growing as a, as a human being and hopefully as a leader, uh, given the kind of roles that so many of you will play. Uh, and so I would, I would hope that we've provoked a few thoughts in all directions as to how we can 
accelerate our stumbling down that path. You know it's never fair when your own words are used against you, is it? <laughs> but, uh, so um, so let, let's, let's go into the case that so many people, so a bunch of you are studying DaVita, right? And if you're a second year, you studied it last year. So, so they clearly want to hear from the CEO about what was the right answer. Um, so what, what, what updates would you give in terms of the, the case they've all been studying on entrepreneurship at DaVita? Yeah, I, I think what I would say about DaVita's experience with entrepreneurship is that we're a, we're a persistent, sort of tenacious B at this point. I don't think we're a role model for success, uh, nor have we failed to try or failed in each try. And I think to create and sustain a sense of entrepreneurship is is a, is, a, is a bit of a journey in and of itself, because there's a lot of internal pressures that make it difficult. Uh, and so, and so we, we are fervent believers. We think it's terrible to create a big company that then has to survive by buying other big companies. It's terrible to become a big company and be too narrow so that you cannot sustain growth forever. And, and so we think it's a, an absolute strategic imperative to get good at entrepreneurship and so many companies don't, which is why they go away. Uh, they go away because they can't attract the talent. They go away because they don't develop the new services or they're overpaying for them because they have to buy them too far downstream. So we believe in it passionately, and we're hoping to improve our grade from a B in the next decade. OK. So um, I, I, don't, I don't mean to say this in an unkind way, but, but I think that, that DMG has been a drag on earnings. And so does that lead you to rethink your strategy in any way in, in terms of how you think about integrated healthcare delivery and so on? Uh, yes and no. Uh, the no in that we are absolutely passionate about delivering integrated care to every patient we touch. And we've started doing it before it was cool in America and, and we'll never give up on that. Uh, Having said that, whenever you have a string of disappointing earnings performances, you, you, you need to stare at why. Uh, in this particular case, 80% of the difficulties come from reimbursement cuts. And so our issue was in appropriately handicapping and forecasting reimbursement cuts as opposed to running the business differently, where our clinical outcomes and our economic outcomes for society continue to be outstanding. But we've got to adjust the cost structure given the dramatic contraction in reimbursement, which affected us disproportionately for reasons I won't torture you with. Uh, but it's actually quite remarkable that we've sustained what we've sustained uh, given the massive cuts we've taken. Uh, but change in general strategy, no. Change in operating strategy, of course, because we have to address the cost structure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me, let me jump into uh, some of the things that have, have, have created quite a bit of buzz uh, for DaVita, such as the, the village idea. So where did this idea of a village come from? Yeah, I, I would give a sort of a two-part answer. One is I came, I was raised in a small town in Wisconsin, and so, so I've actually lived in a community. And I think some people who are raised in certain environments nowadays have never actually lived in one. And uh, in that sense of citizenship and and that you're kind of in it together and, uh, and the community cares about the community and people feel some allegiance to the community. That's, that's how I was raised. It was a, a community of only 12,000 folks. Uh, and so I think that was pivotal because I think communities are very different from just sort of sterile collections of people. And you can have two blocks in a, in a suburb that they look exactly the same, they're socioeconomically the same and demographically the same. And one, the neighbors care about each other and watch out for each other's kids and watch out for suspicious people and uh, respect each other's property. And another one where they don't even know each other's names. And, and so something creates a community. And, and so, so half was, I think, just how I was raised and how I appreciate the power of community. But second was conceptually that that I believe that CEOs and companies should feel an immense moral responsibility to help take care of the people that work in their enterprise and add value to their lives beyond a paycheck. And, and in fact, it's this beautiful reality that there's so much good we can do for the world just by creating a better place to work, separate from what you do on 
charity boards and separate from your philanthropy and in our case separate from what we do take care of patients that that it's an amazing opportunity to achieve your net worth ambitions while doing good for people by being a differentially healthy place for people to work and in searching for the language to do that it was about 18 months in that i realized just talking about mission and values and more abstract concepts of of social contracts wasn't cutting it with you know now we have 20,000 technicians that make 15 bucks an hour. That, that was not, that was, there was nothing wrong with that. But when I would ask people, how do people behave in a healthy community, every single person could give an articulate answer. They had never been to college, uh, never talked to a, a CEO before. Everybody could say, well, this is how people behave in a healthy community. And so I came back for some trips where I was just talking to a lot of teammates and, uh, and announced to the board of directors that we were now a village and my title was mayor, and, and they, they almost fired me because uh, they thought I'd finally really lost it. Um, and I, to be honest, I was quite nervous in starting to use the language uh, because it's so, it was so weird. Uh, and then now it's totally common. I mean, if you, if you come and walk our hallways, you'll hear the term village used 10 times as often as you'll hear the word company, and you'll hear me described as the mayor five times as often as CEO. So coming out of a, of a consulting background, um, how, how did you figure out that the key to success was going to be unlocking the human potential, the, 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 the creating this village as opposed to just saying, let me come up with the best strategy. That's going to be the key to success. Well, half I probably didn't uh, figure it out, was still stumbling. Uh, and when I was at Bain, I was regarded as a, as a strong team builder. But at that point, for me, team building was the means. If I created a better team, they would do more work. They would do more motivated work. They would do more for the client. We'd all get bigger bonuses, get promoted. So, so I was regarded as a good team builder. But it was the means, and better business outcome was the end. And then somewhere along the line, as I started to work uh, subsequent to that in running companies, I flipped. where where profit became the means, business success became the means, and the end became having a positive impact on the world. And, and there's, you, do, you do almost all the same things in either case, but the, the text, texturally is very, very different. And so I think I was just uh, stumbling, uh, and, and it evolved and emerged as opposed to it's showing up with a plan. So. To, to follow up on that, uh, as you evolve as a leader, where do you think you get the highest value added from leadership? And, and what, what does great leadership mean from your point of view? Hmm. Um, I mean, I'll probably stumble on this one, and then you can uh, redirect. The, first of all, what, what we, the way we think about it, getting the most value from leadership is in our lives. This is, this is the way we should live, mindful lives where we care about our, our values and how we behave. So I, what we believe, the biggest value is in that. And then, of course, we know derivatively, if people are happier and there's more trust, you'll have more productivity, you'll have better clinical outcomes, you'll have higher retention. So we get that. Uh, but that's, that's not why. Uh, it's just like you don't want your, to, to teach your kid a lot about how to live well and and work hard in school just because you want them to have a higher income. You want them to have a good life. And, and of course, you also aspire for them to have a solid income. So, so I think in terms of where we get value, I think it's mainly that. And I, now I'm forgetting the second part. Yeah. Well, let me, let me redirect by saying, what do you think has made you so effective as a leader? Well, there's probably a false premise <laughs> loaded in that question, which the people that have worked with me for a while here can can say, he can talk about it, but he sure as hell can't do it. Um, uh, but don't say that right now, because I flew all the way here. And, and uh, uh, the, I, I think when, uh, I've got lots of weaknesses, but what people, what I understand people sense is that I'm, I'm relatively sincere about caring about the people that work at DaVita. And I'm uh, persistent in trying to work on ways to make that better. And so they give me a lot of, cut me a lot of slack when I mess up, either in a business way or a behavioral way, because at this point, a whole bunch of them trust my intentions. 
and not in some naive fairy tale kind of way. You, you can't pay everybody what you'd like to. You, you can't ignore the fact that sometimes you buy and sell things and all the rest. So we don't pretend, just like if you're a mayor of a village, there's times you have to tear down homes to expand a road. There's times you've got to change zoning in a way that leads to issues for people. Um, but it's all part of protecting the village. So, so I think where I get reasonably good scores is on uh, basic intentionality. So you've been, uh, you've been very uh, outspoken in terms of the need for all leaders, yourself included, to continually learn, develop, and grow, and to get honest, transparent feedback. Um, so I want to talk about some of the things that, that you've been open about in terms of feedback that you've gotten and, and how you reconcile uh, this, this clear sense that that the organization trusts you, believes in your good intentions, and yet you have self-reported that you don't say enough nice things, that you give too much criticism relative to the praise. Yeah. Who, came, who gave them all this stuff? <laughs> this, is, this, this is really good. Uh, the, uh, my, I, I've had 360 done every 12 to 18 months at my request with an outside consultant who comes in and, and collects feedback. And I, uh, there were a couple things. You get a 360, you change right away. You're, you're appalled at, at facing certain behaviors. And then there are other things. When I took this job, I was 43. And there's other things that are more deeply ingrained in, in you. And you have to, and to attack them, for me, I had to get quite serious. So for some of them, like the ratio of negative feedback to positive feedback, which I, was, I had a very good ratio with more junior people. And the more senior you got, the worse my ratio was. And so I really had to think about why that was. And, and I tended to have unfair expectations for people who got paid a lot. And I, I thought that we just all had to be ruth, relatively ruthless and working on getting better and better and better because it's what we deserved given what we were differentially paid. But, I, but that was the totally wrong paradigm because the senior people uh, were good people too, and, and they needed a reasonable ratio. And for a couple of these areas, I had to give myself a daily score because the analogy I was used was like an alcoholic. My, my, my brother is 13 years sober now. And in the beginning, he had to win that battle every day. And so I had to give myself daily scores so I could crack the habit of, of doing the negative feedback uh, and, and had to force myself to explore why I was doing it as a part of that daily journey. Um, because it was a deep enough issue, I was not going to just suddenly have an epiphany and behave better. I would behave better for four weeks after the 360, and then I'd regress to my prior level. Yeah. Did I answer? Yeah, yeah. So uh, an earlier version of this that you, again, disclose, it's not like you're hiding this, mm -hmm. uh, was that you would get mad too often. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I'm, I'm curious. Like Coach K, have you heard of Coach K? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> best, best basketball coach ever. But anyway, so Coach K has talked about anger as a strategic tool in his leadership arsenal, which is you, know, you, you act like you're angry um, as a way to just communicate, you know, hey, we got to change this. Were you using, were you getting mad strategically or were you just getting <laughs> mad? Uh, Unfortunately, it was not of the strategic variety. Uh, the, uh, no, I think I had, uh, I felt the, the pressure I felt for the organization to succeed, and because the organization succeeding was required in order to be able to do profit sharing for people, to continue to grow, to sustain the, and retain the great leaders or good leaders, the rest. Uh, and so when I, I, I would have too short a fuse uh, in saying, oh my god, this kind of stuff could put everything at risk. And so anger was a, a grotesquely inappropriate reaction, but nonetheless one that I would have. Uh, and, and it took years to, and, and a couple of these areas now, I get much better scores than I used to because I still get them checked every 12 to 18 months. Um, but it was a real, uh, a real journey to, to get there. Yeah. So let me switch to something uh, that, that's wildly different, which is um, 
in addition to, the, to maybe sometimes getting mad and being too critical, you also will put on a musketeer's costume and... Uniform. Uniform. <laughs> Excuse me. A uniform. Uh, you, will, you will lead call and response chants, and, and, and you really get into character. Uh, is, that, is that natural for you? Is it, is it over the top? <laughs> I, I mean, tell me about what, what's going on there, the method to, the, to whatever's happening. The, uh, <laughs> and I'm going to go backwards for one second and on the anger thing, tell a little story because I, I think it's, uh, it gets to, again, it, it, once you start achieving certain positions with certain responsibility and authority and the rest, in my case, we had 10, 12 years uh, where we were a very, very high performing uh, company from a stock price point of view uh, and clinical differentiation and, and other things. And in that situation, the CEO becomes uh, quite powerful. And it's easy to also, therefore, get a little bit numb to the criticisms that might come in the 360, because you kind of go, other people don't get the pressure that you're under, and all the rationalizations you, you might do, and, and the stress that you feel, and, and all the rest. And, and there's a limit to how much people will push, because at that point, you're just at the peak of your of your sort of perceived and actual power and efficacy and the rest. And so I felt a time or two I, I was worried I was, I was not intensely enough pursuing my own personal growth in those realms. So a couple times I took my 360 back and gave it to my parents, my wife, and my kids. Hmm. And that was particularly humbling, which is what I was worried I, I needed. And the, and the one story I sometimes tell is I, I gave it to my daughter, was 13 at the time, Christina, uh, and, and she was now, she's now 27, and she read it and came back downstairs and, and said, Daddy, I read the report, and, and I said, okay, honey, what did you, what'd you learn? And I was you know, hoping she's gonna say, Daddy, they say you're a strong leader, and they say they like working with you, and they say they're proud of all the village's accomplishments, and she didn't say any of that. Uh, instead, she goes, Daddy, I don't get it, uh, because you tell us that if someone does their best, that's what counts in life. And, and in here it says sometimes people do their best, but you're disappointed and you get angry with them and make them feel bad. So what's up with that, Daddy? And, and I, you know, my jaw kind of drops and I'm staring at my little beloved daughter and I, I'm asking myself why in the hell I gave her the report. And, <laughs> And, uh, and finally, I said, well, Chrissy, Daddy just hasn't grown up enough yet in that way. And now she's totally befuddled, because she says, you know, you're older than the hills. And <laughs> my understanding is they let you run the place. And you can't even behave the way you tell a 14-year-old, a 13-year-old. Uh, so a anyway, I, I, think, uh, I think keeping yourself on a growth trajectory requires having people around who will be very objective with you and sometimes requiring very structured programs of self-awareness, at least for me. On to the uniform. Uh, the, it, it, was not in, it was not intentional. Uh, the, the, well, I get to half and half. We, we, once we decided we wanted to be a community first and a company second, we sat down like you would if you were doing a project or in, in my parlance, if it was a Bain case team working. Uh, and saying, OK, we want to create a differentially healthy place for people to work uh, that feels like a community. Uh, because a community doesn't have to be a geographic area. A community can be a religion. It can be a tribe. It can be a book club. It can be a family. It can be best friends. There's certain attributes of what represents a community. And, and we want to be a community first, coming second. And we established the, the, the sort of five, six pillars. We, I still have the slide of what it takes to create a sustainable community. And, uh, and, and one of the boxes was, was language and another was uh, traditions, rituals, et cetera. That's what, that's what healthy communities have. Uh, and uh, and so, so the notion of having our, some of our own phrases uh, and words made a lot of sense to us, that that's what healthy cultures do. And then it was just by chance that, that for the very, in the very first meeting, when, in the first nine months of my time at DeVita, we woke up every morning knowing that if a single bank asked for a single dollar, we were bankrupt because we couldn't pay 
We had broken every covenant. We were close to missing payroll on 8,000 people. So every, night, every day for nine months, that's how we woke up. And, and we, nonetheless, we started from day one working on this notion of creating a special place to work. And, and so we had the first time where, I was, where the, the top 110 people came from around the country. And we, we, we were at the, the Crown Plaza in Redondo Beach, California. And that night, we had our first dinner. And I'm meeting all these people for the first time, except for maybe the 15 that were at corporate. And the second floor of a cheesecake factory, where we had the dinner. That's all we could afford. And, uh, and I, at the last minute, the day two, a couple days before, I said, go buy, at that point, some costumes, because I had recently seen a movie called The Man in the Iron Mask. And I said, we're going to need a skit. It's going to be a pretty brutal day. We're going to go over our financial situation. We're going to talk about the, the dream of creating the greatest dialysis company the world had ever seen and sharing life's journey. And a whole bunch of them are going to think it's a bunch of bullshit uh, and, and sort of retention rhetoric and wondering about this MBA whose last company got taken over and is he just going to flip this? And so it's going to be quite a day. And, and so let's, for fun, do a skit at the end. And we wrote a skit uh, uh, that sort of roughly paralleled our story and the Musketeer story. And at the end of that night, we did, uh, I led the team in one for all for one. Um, and now there was, there was some alcohol involved at that point. Uh, but the response was kind of amazing. Uh, and you go, you know, wow, it's just way more energetic than you ever would have thought. Uh, and you can sort of get, get, still, I remember I got goosebumps. But you say, OK, it was a skit. Everybody had been drinking. We're all tired. We're all scared if our company's going to go bankrupt. And then fast forward three months, and we had our first nationwide meeting with all the managers and above, which so it's 600, 700 people. And we said, you know, my God, we're working so hard. Let's do the same skit. And, and then the third night, we did this skit, and we handed out little musketeer hats and swords and, and did it. And once again, it just sort of blew you away at the end of the night, the energy. Uh, but again, just sort of dismissed it. Everybody, again, we're not, we do this all the time, but there had been drinking involved again. And, and, uh, but then emails started coming in in the subs with people showing pictures. I put my hat and sword up on the bulletin board in my clinic in, in New York City, my clinic in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, and, and people started putting the bottom of their emails, one for all, or one for all and all for one. And, and it took me about two, three weeks to realize, oh my god, we really struck a chord. And, and fast forwarded all the way then uh, that we realized how much people want those words to be true. And if they sense they might be true, they say them with great energy. And then we also, at that point, I decided we, we were going to work on some other phrases. Because if you have a tribe that is spread across the country, you have to have shared language. You have to have shared stories. And so uh, right in that same period, we worked on other call and response, all of which means something to us. Um, and I, I won't torture you with what they are. Um, but they mean something to a very high percentage of our people. And it's way more powerful to say them that way, 4,000 people cheering in a room, than, than delivering some boring speech. So you're in a profession where CEOs don't last that long. And, and you've lasted a long, long time. Not that you're old, but <laughs> you've lasted a long, long time. It was implied. Uh, <laughs> So what's, what's the key to your longevity? What, what keeps you motivated uh, so that you can sustain this incredible energy that's required of anyone in your position? Yeah, so I've, I'm 61. I've been a CEO since I was 35. So it's 20, 26 years. And, uh, and my, what I realized X years ago, I don't know what X is, is I, the good news for me is I love what I do. And there's just, I've, I'll obviously I interact with a lot of CEOs, and so many of them bitch about their job, you know, and, and talk about, you know, it's hard in this way, and it's unfair in this way, and, and I just sit there at the dinner or whatever, and say, hey, quit. You know, what, what, what's your problem? Uh, you know, you got enough money. Uh, if you're not loving what you do, what a joke to keep doing it when you've got choices. Uh, and, and so I think the, the answer on that one is, is simple. I, for what I, I think part of the art of life, you know, people talk about work, work versus personal life balance. I say, no, the, the art of life is not balancing the two. The art of life is, is creating a third slice, which is when you do things that are both. And, and for me, for example, being here, that's, this is work. Because I hope some of you think about coming to, 
DeVita. Uh, this is also, when I was in your seat back in 1981 to 83, my dream was to be able to talk about issues like leadership and more conscious capitalism with young leaders that are going to change the lives of a lot of people. That was my dream. So for me, a day like today is actually very special personally for my dreams, separate from, hopefully, I, I add some freaking value for my company, uh, and some of you think about interviewing. So, so I think that's what has allowed me to keep going. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've had a lifelong fascination with politics. Public and service. Public service. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you're making a distinction now, OK? Uh, and, uh, and actually, there was a lot of speculation that you were going to run for governor this, uh, this year. You, you chose not to. But is that an itch that's, that's there for you to, to throw, yourself, throw yourself into public service in a different way? Because you're in public service now, aren't you? These are the most probing questions I've ever had. <laughs> you guys did not tell me what this. Um, I, I, I love this, because it's the whole idea of doing these things is so you get to hear what it's really like, separate from the pablum. The, uh, so I've, I've wanted to be a, an elected official since I was probably 10 years old. I used to read every book on Abraham Lincoln. That was always my dream, to serve my country and the world that way. Uh, and, and if I hadn't gotten into health care, and then if I hadn't developed the sort of psychological model of wanting to create a differentially healthy place for real people to work, I would have probably left the for-profit sector a long time ago. Because in the old days, I had that more classic paradigm of for-profits for making money and establishing financial independence. And then you switch over and do something that's not for-profit and charity-oriented. And, it's a, and a, that model is fine, but it's a, there's this alternative model of staying in the for-profit world and adding lots and lots of value for the world. And, and so uh, it was a, a big decision. And I don't know if I will do it later in life, but, but what I was forced to have to think about a lot was how much of my doing that was for reasons of ego, uh, that it would be really cool to be a, a governor, uh, versus a rational assessment of over the next six years, which way am I more likely to add more value, probabilistically, by keeping this job and doing what I do and making money, all of which is going to be given away. We're never going to spend any of it. Uh, or spending a year and a half running for office, winning, and, and potentially getting almost nothing done, because it's a very polarized legislative situation. And even though I think my athletic ability is relatively a good fit for this that sport, nonetheless, doing something new, you always have to discount how quickly you'll get good at it. And so I might be staring at myself suddenly being 67 and having spent five years and not added that much value. And, and I would have tried. I would have felt very good about my effort. But, it, but in the end, at this my age, you don't want to just get good grades for effort. Uh, given my alternative path, it's very high probability I can get good stuff done. And so, so that was the calculus. How much ego and what's highest and best use? And then, and then lastly, uh, in part because of some of the, the issues we've had in the company from a performance point of view, is it, is it, would it be an irresponsible time for me to leave the village that I love? And, and the answer on that one was, you know, there were, were variables across all of the, that spectrum of issues, but it was, would not have been a great time for, the, for a departure. Do you think that, that your job in the private sector has become more complicated given the, the, the collision between politics and business in, in the current environment? Ab absolutely. And I will put health care aside for a moment. But the, a big difference, just even in the last 10 years now, is companies asked to take positions on social issues. So, uh, so what do you think about uh, the uh, lesbian, gay, et cetera, rights? And, and what are you willing to say publicly? Uh, are you willing to uh, sell products or services to certain people? Um, the, what are you going to say about Charlottesville uh, the, publicly? Uh, when are you willing to criticize the president? Uh, now, these 10 years ago, uh, the incidents of CEOs being asked internally or externally to take stands on these kinds of things was literally 1 20th what it is today. And, and it involves some very careful reckoning 
so, for example, on one of these issues, I, go to a, I, I simultaneously polled a bunch of people in our organization and the board of directors. And the people in the organization were 80% in favor of my taking a very public stance uh, in, in writing with the media. 80% uh, of our board was against it. And, and these are good, thoughtful people. They just said, this is, we don't have a dog in that hunt. You know, your private views are your own. Uh, putting the company at risk is irresponsible. You had lots of patients you're accountable for and all the rest. If you're subject to political retaliation, you're going to not be able to give raises to nurses. They're going to leave. Your clinical quality is going to go down. People are going to be hurt. So, so, so that's, you know, that, that's just a new part of life for a, for a CEO. You know. Okay, and that's going to be a, a new part of life for, for all of you. And so I want to ask one more question before turning it over to the audience, which really turns it around in terms of advice for, uh, for the students, which is you use the phrase uh, corporate athlete. So what does it mean to be a corporate athlete, and how do you build uh, better capabilities as, a, as an athlete? Yeah, so we in general, we lean towards hiring for athletic ability and character versus specific uh, skill sets or experience sets. We do that because we believe that, it, that growing general managers and leaders is the single best thing we can do for our village. And unless you have that philosophy at the lower levels, people don't accumulate this set of experiences which allow them to be excellent general managers and, and leaders. Uh, and, and so we need to have more fluidity in how people move around and demonstrate athletic ability and accumulate less in any one category, but more overall. And, th and then we need young people who are brave enough to do that, because there's a, no matter what they say when they're in the second year in school, they're suddenly they're doing well in one area, and they're comfortable with their boss, and you know, they, get, they know they're going to keep doing well. And, and you say, I want you to move into a whole other area where you're actually going to be behind everybody because you don't have domain knowledge, and it's going to be with a new boss. And suddenly, all the things that they thought strategically go out the window. And, and, uh, and by the way, they just had their first baby, and, and they want more make sure they maintain this optimal control over their work-life balance and all the rest. Um, so, so that's what we mean, um, mean that, that, it's, that we believe in general athletic talent. And then, it, and then we invest disproportionately compared to most companies to develop it. And then we need people who are oriented that way. OK. All right, I'm going to turn it over to the audience. Questions? Or advice? Here we go back here. Have you got a microphone? Yeah, and there's one in the middle, too. OK. It's a little dark up here, so if we, you might have to wave your hand. Yeah. Hi, my name is Alex. I just want to know if you could expand a little bit upon the decision that you go in polling, whether you should have a, a public response on a political issue. I know in, in the year instance, you said you just did a poll of your workers and a poll of the board. But is there a more, are there more steps in that in terms of coming up with your, your private view? Or are you saying this is the company's view? And just, could you expand upon that a little bit? Yeah, uh, so I don't, there's no pat answer to this because each one of these different situations is a, a bit different, whether it's North Korea or, or Charlottesville or gay rights or gay marriage or whatever. Uh, so the answer is always different. And I think the, the, what we're developing over time is a set of sort of filters for thinking about it, which is kind of, uh, to what extent can we say something that we think is reflective of the overwhelming majority of our people? Because some, some companies come out with something, and literally half their employees, not, not for our parlance, it's teammates, disagree. Well, a, a CEO should be real careful before he or she says something that half. And, and so, for example, in some of these cases, we have, we have, we have 75,000 teammates. We have a very substantial percentage who voted for, the, for President Trump. And, and they're thoughtful people with good hearts and good brains, and they did that. And so if I'm going to say something critical of the president, I better, better be damn thoughtful about making sure that it's said in a way that is not inconsistent uh, with their basic view of the person. 
and is more transactional. So there's questions like what percentage of your employees do you think think that way or not and, and why? Second is what realistic probability do you have of, of impact, uh, of, of, of it making a difference? Uh, third is, is for how many of your teammates will they be exceptionally pleased uh, that you really like the fact their company is taking that stance? It's legitimate to count that. Fourth is how will your customers react, customers, clients, partners? Fifth, what expectations are you creating for commentary on future issues? And if you say yes to commenting on one, and then you don't on the next, are you going to get reamed for that? And, and then so you have to be prepared to explain why. Uh, uh, six or seven, whatever number I'm on, is, is to what extent are we at risk of getting retaliated against? Because we live in a world where we deal with Congress uh, all the time. Uh, and I sit with the senators from both parties all the time, uh, as well as in state legislatures. Uh, seventh is, of course, your basic moral code. Eighth is, are you gonna, is it going to be more a thing about what I believe versus, versus what the village believes? Uh, so, so that's, you know, then nine, of course, is what's the tone going to be? And is there a way, because so often when these things pop up, you, it's almost like you're, you're given a relatively binary choice. Say this or nothing. Eh, the world's way more nuanced. And so in many cases, we think it's an opportunity and at least one or two times we achieved it by writing something that sort of everybody said, okay, that's a useful way to parse it. It's, it's, not, it's not binary. Uh, it's not black and white. Uh, you don't have to demonize people. You can express disappointment. You can talk about why you, you feel disappointed, why you're uncomfortable. That's very different from saying, you know, someone says a schmuck that, you know, really messed up. Uh, so those are some of the filters that are emerging now that we've had to, we go through it with more and more Frequency. The first time we didn't have any such list, and you know, we, I just ended up talking to a bunch of people. But you have an actual list that you go through, or it just in my head? Oh, okay. No, the, <laughs> Good enough. The, yeah. <laughs> but now that I did it, actually, Ken, if you take notes, that, <laughs> that was not a bad damn list. <laughs> it was. It was yeah. excellent. Yes. And the and the fervency with which your teammates believe in some of this stuff. Uh, you know, the, and, and so they'll come and demand to say, how can you not write about this? Uh, and, and in particular, my case, uh, given the governor thing and everything else in, in, within the Colorado, the, the media, there's a reasonable chance that what I say will get printed. And so they'll say, you know, we need to have your voice. I say, well, first of all, it's not really my voice. You know, sort of the village owns, you know, 60% of this voice, and I get 40 or whatever the numbers are. So first of all, uh, and, and second, you know, it's a currency to be deployed carefully. I'm sorry, sir. Thanks very much, Kent. Uh, Two-part question. When you're hiring and building an org, like searching for that uh, athletic activity, how do you personally select for those characteristics when in the hiring process there's so, much, so little data that you can judge? And then how do you operationalize that in the org when you have such a giant company and people all over need to be making these types of decisions? Yeah, so on, on the first one, a couple of my uh, favorite interviewing techniques uh, or practices that help me get a feeling for the, for the person is sort of begin with the end of mind. I always ask about career and life aspirations. I want to know how articulate and thoughtful the person is about what they want to do with their own life. Uh, and, uh, and then typically I'll ask why. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, separately, if a person's been out of school a while, I ask them to go through every single decision they've made. What college, what major, what first job, what graduate school, what concentration in graduate school, what job. But I said, I don't want to hear about anything great you did in any of those places. Yeah, I just want to know why you chose what you chose each time. Uh, so I'm just very big on, on, on whys. Um, and then the third one is I'll ask about uh, failures. You know, tell me when you want a do-over. Give me, a, give me a time when you really wish you could do something over. And it's amazing to me how many people, and particularly older successful executives, what a terrible time they have admitting to a failure. You know, and, and, and if they do, it's, but it was, you know, the odds were stocked against me. You know, I inherited a terrible division. Uh, it's just like when you ask people for weaknesses, and, and then 60% of executives will say, well, I'm impatient. Yeah, but, but it's because I'm so demanding and have such high standards. And you say, what a crock. I mean, if you, <laughs> if you do not know that you have worse weaknesses than that, you know, then you shouldn't, we don't want you here. 
because we're a lot about self-awareness and self-honesty. We all have faults. We all behave poorly sometimes. Th th that's the way we're all the same. What differentiates them from others is those who can talk about it uh, in a reasonably thoughtful, self-aware way. Because if you can't, you're, you're not even close to the journey of dealing with it. On the broader issue, uh, you know, we, what, I'll just answer one part and then not, not ramble on. The, that every single interview, which of course is never that way across the entire village, uh, that the, the candidate gets evaluated according to the, the mission and values. And, and you just think about it, how many places say, well, we really care about our mission, we, we really care about our values, but they interview people and it's not explicitly part of the discussion. And, I, and to me, that's like if you were Coach K, and you were recruiting somebody to be guard in the basketball team and you didn't watch them shoot. Yeah, you know, ridiculous, because that's shooting's a big part of what you want the guard to do. Uh, well, you're talking about your values and not have, and so, and we know it's highly imperfect, but by being on the form, it reminds our teammates that they should think about values when they're deciding when, they're, when they want to give an offer to Tammy or Fred. Um, and it, often they'll talk about it, which then reminds them of, you know, we're supposed to care about it. And for some candidates, they'll go, whoa, I, I actually, you know, kind of resonate with that, and it creates sort of positive karma that, uh, and so that's something we do to broadly uh, encourage it. Um, hello, hi. Um, thank you for coming. Where is my quite. Where is this person? Oh, sorry. Ah, no. the um, voice my, of God. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is: um, You talked about building a village, a community within Davida, and per the case, um, you your focus is on offering value to your patients and um, building a consolidated sort of like end-to-end -end healthcare um, scheme. Um, with the current political situation, um, uh, with the vote, with the, the tax, the vote on the tax bill also being seen as a vote on Obamacare, it's moved from the House to the Senate. And if it's passed in the Senate, how do you, plan to reposition or, you know, Davida to still achieve its goal on offering value to customers, you know, when there's insufficient funds from insurance firms, you know, to, to pay your company. Right. Thank you. So some folks in the room aren't too healthcare oriented, so I'll try to be really concise and simple. First, uh, from a matter of principle, uh, we actually use the village metaphor for making decisions. So in tough decisions, we think about what if you were mayor of a village and it's in a recession, what do you do? Uh, if there's technological disruption, what do you do? If you're, and, and so with real families and real citizens, and we try, try to live that way. And, and in our village, everyone would have access to health care. You know, to me, it's a basic, in our community, everyone would have access to health care. Uh, and that doesn't mean there aren't uh, resource constraints on, ex on exactly what that can look like for everyone, but as a basic condition. Uh, second, the healthcare people whine a lot. Uh, and we are the most generously funded healthcare system in the world. Uh, and so get over it. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, we waste a lot and we own that as an industry. And we, by not doing enough ourselves, have created a world where politicians who are short-term and superficial uh, on this subject are making a lot of decisions uh, because we haven't done well enough ourselves. And so we shouldn't be pointing the finger at them. We should be pointing the finger at ourselves. And then them, because they're screwing up so badly. Uh, and, uh, and, so, and so for us, we're going we're gonna to get by. if. We're not going to suddenly, and no one is going to suddenly go belly up. They're going to whine, and we should just keep on getting better every year, no matter exactly what the funding is. Uh, and uh, in some years it'll be good, in some years it'll be bad. So, so that's how, that's how we think of it. And we have our own piece of legislation where we, we're just going to introduce in the Senate and the House. Uh, kid, this is about our to be the kidney care division, uh, but both in kidney care and, and medical group, we have. We are the clinical leader in both of those entire segments of the American healthcare world, and we're very, very proud of that. And we love it because we're forcing our competition to chase us, and we're affecting patients we don't even touch. But in kidney care, which is 7% of the Medicare budget, we've got legislation which will allow us to transform kidney care for all the dialysis patients across America. 
and, and we have an unusual level of bipartisan support. We passed the House Ways and Means Committee 39 to 1 a year ago this time. Nothing passed the House, that's the power committee in the House. Nothing substantive passed that polarized committee 39 to 1, much less even uh, 22 to 20, whatever the numbers would add up to. Um, uh, and so if you, don't, if you don't whine and you work on it, as we did for years, we now have this beautiful piece of bipartisan legislation that may very well pass, which is virtually unheard of for a single slice, and we will, we will save hundreds of millions of dollars for the system while dramatically improving quality. And that's what other industry segments should do, is appropriately pressuring these people to perform. But separate from that, get out there and do your job and improve care and reduce cost. And if you're not doing that, you're a crappy provider and you're a crappy health plan. And we got a bunch of them that spent too much time blaming the government and not looking in the mirror. Not that I feel strongly, but. <laughs> There's one there, too. Hi. Um, so my question is around uh, the case again, um, the entrepreneurship um, initiative of Paladina Health. So we are sitting in class and brainstorming, and, and we had some ideas. But I wanted to hear your thoughts on kind of what was your long-term vision uh, when you started Paladina Health and whether you think you've been somewhat successful at it. Yeah. So Paladina Health, uh, I, get, I get excited about a lot of things. but, uh, but Palliative Health, uh, the idea, this, uh, for those who might not recall, this is where we go to employers and help them. Uh, we have an on-site or a near-site primary care clinic. And it's, it is beautiful what it does because you have lots of real-world real world people who, uh, to go to a normal primary care physician means they got to make an appointment that's three weeks out. Uh, it's uh, from there where they work or home, it's a drive. They gotta take time off. It disrupts taking the kids to school or whatever else. Um, they're gone for a long time. They go there, they sit and wait. Uh, they get you know, seven minutes with the doctor. And, they, and, and so it's, it's a productivity, uh, it's abysmal. Um, and, and both in terms of inefficiency and in value and follow-up because the, the way, so this, in this case, it's a very focused group. They have our physician's cell phone number and they can call it 24-7 uh, in, in most cases. And, and there's follow-up, and, and so we'll check, and the, and the physician and the, and the staff will follow up to see, are you, are you taking your meds? Are you losing some weight? Are you doing whatever else? Which has a tremendous difference in terms of actual uh, teammate slash patient engagement. Um, and for us, for, for like-minded employers, it creates this ability for an employer to demonstrate that you care about people, uh, and you care about helping them take care of themselves and their family, and then over time, we hope to evolve our, our service capabilities so we can become more and more of a partner in health and prevention uh, versus more treatment, which is where we're about now. So that's the, that's the, the notion behind it. Thank you for coming. Um, my question is about DeVita's international expansion. As you've moved outside of the borders of the United States, what have you learned? Be a lot. I got. I can show you the scars on my back, and the empty spots in our wallet. Uh, um, the we decided uh, if I was a better CEO, we would have gone outside of the U.S. 10 or 12 years ago. But I wasn't, so we we did five, six years ago, and we decided to do very aggressively and went into 10 other countries in relatively short order, knowing that we would make a bunch of mistakes, but we were in a hurry to learn yeah, for a whole bunch of reasons. And so we did that. Uh, I, would, I would say uh, two, two things in particular. One uh, is the, the absolute, it, it's so self-evident to say that you want uh, local, uh, locally raised executives, uh, but the energy it takes to get there is so great. Um, and the real world obstacles that come from the amount of time it takes to fly to Germany or to Saudi Arabia or to India or to China or to Brazil, all of which we're active in, really disrupts any kind of normal search process. And so I would have really twisted, maybe even gone to fewer countries so that we could have allocated myself and another person more time to getting the right, finding the right needle in the haystack locally as opposed to having that take two or three years. Um, so. Again, we would have said the right thing, and, and I went out and talked to a bunch of other friends, CEOs who had running 
running multinational companies for a long time and got the right advice, but, I, but it needed a much more radical approach. Uh, and then the second thing uh, I asked the, the different CEOs, they, it was about our culture, and the consensus was, you know, that, that stuff you do is, is weird in America. You know, forget it in Saudi Arabia uh, <laughs> and China and, and Poland, Poland and, and uh, Colombia. And, and so uh, leave it at the airport. And, and so I, for the first year and a half, uh, I slash we took their advice. And we, we, we started up in these places and we didn't talk about the village. And we didn't do the stuff we do. Because, because I took the advice. And I was giving a talk in India to 125 software engineers. And it is a talk, I could tell it went totally flat. And I, so I went up to the boss after, and he and I had a, enough of a relationship, so he was, I said, be honest with me. That, that didn't go that well. And he said, KT, go walk through their cubicles, because they had come in on a day off to be with me. Go walk through their cubicles. You'll see they've got the mission and the values up. They, they've got village imagery up. They've got the timeline of, of their growth within the village. Uh, and, uh, and, and so they, they know about it. They've read about it. Uh, they thought they were a part of it. And now they feel like you know, they're like foreigners uh, working for a village as a subcontractor, but not a part of it. Uh, and I, I was so angry with myself and appalled. I went and immediately sent a voicemail back to the state saying, from this moment forward, we are one village across the world, multiple neighborhoods, one village, and, and I'd much rather make that mistake than the mistake we're making now. And what we found out is that our, our values are not DeVita values and they're not American values, they're universal values. And you could pick seven other ones. I mean, we had a list of 100 and went through a nine-month process of an election process for people to choose the ones that they most wanted to be emphasized. Uh, and, uh, and, and from that moment forward, uh, we've been one village. And some of our healthiest neighborhoods in the world are outside the US. And part of that is because people in the US, especially after you've worked with us for a while, can kind of take what we do for granted. People in other countries don't. Hi, I think I've got the last question. Um, I want to bounce off two things that you've talked about today. One being having to look into ourselves to approach the health situation that we individuals and as a society find ourselves in today. And the second being at, as your role of the mayor of a village where you're promoting wellness and you're promoting longevity and a community that cares about each other, how do you use DeVita as like a microcosm of where society wants to move to, where there's a, a focus on prevention, there's a, a focus on wellness in a given situation, and how can that then be expanded maybe to a nationally uh, healthcare system in maybe an ideal world? Yeah, let me, let me hit the second one first, because we, the first few years of DeVita, we didn't, we didn't agree. We, we, had, we would always have professors or consultants come through to help us think and brainstorm about how we could realize our, our dream of creating a seriously, differentially healthy place for people to work and, uh, and send forth ripples of citizen leadership. But we wouldn't agree to have anything written about us because we didn't want to be distracted. And then we, we realized over time that, number one, that was foolish because once some bad things started happening, if you didn't have positive press out there to balance it, you were, you were going to be in worse shape. So you have to manage proactively on some of the positive stuff. And second, as we thought about it more and we started to get more momentum and people were paying more attention, we said we would like to provoke thought. And that's a way to affect people we'll never work with. Uh, and that's when we agreed to the case, the, the Harvard case studies and the Stanford case study and, uh, and some other stuff to be written. Uh, and, and so, uh, and, and then, on the, and then we, we also try to, in speaking engagements, not, not like this, but when I'm actually talking, I have a section, so I'm in a room with 40 CEOs. The, I'll go through some of the things we do in, in wellness. So I'll go through, we have a, we have a silent retreat that, that happens in sort of a, semi-monastery type thing in California. We have to be the great outdoors. We take groups of 12 out in the woods and do reflections on their you know, days, three days with no devices, actually four days, three nights, no devices, facilitated times for reflection on the village and on yourself and on your living life's values. We have academies where we have every single teammate 
is invited to two days where it's all about uh, self-awareness and our rituals and our language, nothing about business, no applied training, and, and a technician's right next to a cardiologist. Uh, and so, and every, every single, virtually every course in Davida University is what we call Davidified, which means there's, there's elements of introspection and self-awareness, even in a course on financial management. And so, uh, and then we, we have our own Paladina working in our clinics. We do an annual Match the Mayor, where for four to six weeks, I do a, a, a kind of a blog every other day, and we have software, and everybody tr has a, a life goal, something to make their life healthier. Could be read a book a week, could be take a walk after lunch, could be lose weight. And, and I track what I'm doing every day according to the goals, and so they see the mayor fitting it in with plane trips and all the rest. So that's just six, seven, eight examples. If I were talking about this to a bunch of executives, I'd have another 17 uh, for how we invest in uh, wellness, both spiritual, mental, physical, emotional within our community, because that's the best thing to do, because then these executives ask for copies of the decks, they, they, they copy down the idea they like the most or two, and then they take them elsewhere. So, so that's what we do internally, and then we try to, uh, when asked, talk about it, uh, because that's where you get the replication in the copying. On, on, on the first one, I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So even at our big meetings, there'll be we have free yoga sessions, and well, I won't do, do more of the list, but because uh, I think I answered in that. And given people up in the last row usually were thinking of leaving early, that I'm so glad you stayed and asked a question because that I didn't, yeah. I didn't lose you. Well, this is the end of our program. Um, I think when Bill first conceptualized uh, the Distinguished Speaker Series, he imagined that students would have the opportunity of learning beyond the classroom, and you have helped bring that to reality today. So it has been a pleasure as a student, <clears throat> excuse me, as a student engaging with the DeVita case in the classroom, but an even bigger pleasure and honor to have the opportunity to hear directly from you today about DeVita, the culture, and the community you've been able to build. So thank you for traveling here uh, during this holiday week to be with us. Um, thank you, Bill, for creating DSS. And we are so glad, Kent, to have you um, and to have Fequins going back uh, to DeVita. And we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Right. Hey, wait, wait one sec. Wait, wait one sec. I've got to do this. So I'm so impressed that on a Tuesday night before Thanksgiving, you are here. I'm so impressed that I flew here on a Tuesday night before Thanksgiving. So I'll oh, give a pen or back. So remember that, you guys. Um, but I just, uh, I, I rarely do this, but I, it's, the questions were so awesome uh, that, uh, that it gets you out of your safety zone. So just, if you picture we're all in one company, uh, and, and, the, and the words were true, one for all and all for one, I just want you to feel what it's like if you imagine that you really did feel that way about each other in the quest we're on. Not that you're going to stay in the, work in the same company forever, nothing outside of real life. But while you're together, you have a special bond. So I'm going to call out one for all. I'd like you to just say all for one back if you feel like it, <laughs> uh, to see what it's like if, you, if, there's, if it's said with energy and, and imagine some sincerity. So if we are to build the greatest dialysis company the world has ever seen, let it be like this one for all. All for one. Damn straight. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>